Okay, everybody. Now for our third teaching session of the morning, I want to talk about the glorious return of Jesus step by step. I believe it with all my heart. I trust you do too. Jesus Christ is coming again. It's a fundamental aspect of our faith. As I said before, it's part of the Apostles' Creed. He shall come to judge the living and the dead. And the biblical description of the return of Jesus the Messiah has a lot more texture than just the simple phrase, Jesus Christ is coming again. That phrase is absolutely true. But the scriptures tell us a lot more about his return than just that. So I'm going to talk about it in three aspects right now. Number one, Jesus is coming for his church. Number two, the earth will endure a terrible season before the glorious return of Jesus. We've talked about that somewhat already. And then number three, Jesus will return in conquering glory to this earth. So number one here, Jesus is coming for his church. I believe that this is a separate aspect of the second coming. If you were to ask me to define, well, let, let me give my caveat that I often give when I'm talking about these kind of subjects. We're talking about the subjects of biblical eschatology with end times events. Many Christians throughout the centuries have had many different opinions and perspectives on this. People who see it differently than I do, than I'm going to present to you right now, they're not unspiritual. They're not stupid. They're not unfaithful. But honestly, I don't think they're right either. I, I mean, I, I don't mind saying what I present to you right now, I think this is correct biblically. And I think that people who believe differently are wrong in what they believe. Now, I think I understand why they believe it. I think I understand where they get to it and how it might be viewed differently. I want to respect them, but I, I'm not a prophetic agnostic. Whereas, well, we just can't know anything. All we can say is that Jesus is coming again. I believe there are things we can know. And, and because of the study that I've done in the scriptures... I believe that there are two significant aspects to the second coming of Jesus. The first significant aspect of the second coming of Jesus is his coming for his church. And the second significant aspect is his coming with the church in glory to the earth. You see, unless the scriptures contradict themselves, and I don't believe they do, I believe that there must be two distinct phases, so to speak, of Jesus' second coming. One coming to receive his people and one coming to consummate his judgment against those who reject and rebel against him. And that those two phases of Jesus' coming must be separated by some appreciable period of time. My friends, there are people maybe many people who think that this catching away of the church that God describes in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, that that'll basically be like a U-turn in the sky. The church will go up and meet Jesus in the clouds and then do an immediate U-turn and come back with him in glory. I don't believe that's true. I believe this based on the simple principle that the scriptures do not contradict themselves. Therefore, when I read... Jesus describing his coming in the context of two different kinds of world conditions. Sometimes Jesus says, when I return, I'm going to return to a world that's carrying on normally. In the Olivet Discourse, we read that verse earlier today. Jesus said, um, when I return, people will be eating and drinking, giving in marriage, marrying and be married. It'll be life as normal. Then in another place, it describes that Jesus will come at a time of tribulation unmatched in all of human history. Well, which one is it? 
Is it to a business as usual world or is it to a world in catastrophe? I say yes. His coming for the church is to a business as usual world. His glorious second coming is to a world in catastrophe. We also have different approaches of Jesus Christ to the earth described. Some passages describe Jesus meeting his church in the clouds. That's the catching away, or some people call it the rapture. Other passages describe Jesus coming with his church in judgment. There's different positions of the people of God described. Some passages describe the people of God meeting the Lord in the air. Other passages describe the church coming with Jesus in glory. Which one is it? I say yes. Again, two different aspects of the second coming. And then there's also different scenarios regarding the predictability of the date of Jesus' return. Some passages describe Jesus' return at a time that is unknowable to any human being. No man knows the day or the hour. Then did you know that there's other passages of Scripture that say that from this critical event that I mentioned before, the abomination desolation, it'll be a specific number of days until the end. So which one is it? Is it a day that you can start marking on your calendar from the abomination desolation or a day that nobody could know? Again, I say, yes. The catching away of the church, the rapture of the church happens at a time no one will know, but you can date the second coming in glory from the time of the abomination desolation. Again, it's just all simply based on the fact that the scriptures do not contradict themselves and we're given these different aspects. Now, sometimes I'll hear people mock the idea that I've just presented to you. They'll say, huh, so what do you have? Two second comings? How many second comings do you want? Jesus didn't say three comings. He said second coming. You know, they, they carry on. And I just simply say, how many aspects to the first coming of Jesus were there? How many events were there associated with his first coming? Well, he was conceived in Mary's womb. He was born as a baby in Bethlehem. He came out of Egypt. He began his ministry uh, at his baptism with John the Baptist. He was presented to Israel as triumphant king at the triumphal entry. I could point to you at least five different aspects of the first coming of Jesus. Why would we be surprised if there's two significant aspects to his second coming? That's simply how we would explain that. So, the first aspect of Jesus' second coming is his coming for the church to catch them away. And that's what we as God's people want to be ready for to come at any moment for his people without trying to sound melodramatic. It, it is interesting to think that it could happen before the sun sets today. And wouldn't that be awesome? I mean, that just, we just say, come quickly, Lord Jesus. He, he can't come soon enough for me. Okay, that's the first thing. The second thing we understand is that the earth will endure a terrible season before the glorious return of Jesus. Now, this is going to be the worst time seen in human history. Matthew chapter 24, verses 21 and 22 says this, for then there will be great tribulation, such as not been seen since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Friends, do you realize what a staggering statement Jesus made right there? He called this period the great tribulation, he said it'll be the worst time that planet Earth has ever seen. I have to say, I almost don't know what to do with a statement like that. When I consider historically in the 14th century that a third of Europe died in the Black Death, the bubonic plague. Jesus said, no, worse than that. I consider that in the 13th century, or maybe I'm getting confused, it might be the 12th century, that the Mongol invasions across Asia and into Europe killed millions upon millions of people and destroyed city after city, including up to 30% of the population of China. 
That might be the most devastating season of war and destruction that the earth has ever seen. Jesus said, no, this is going to be worse. Staggering to think about, isn't it? This is the period that we call the Great Tribulation. And the crisis and calamity of those days is going to reach all of humanity. So that's what we have. We have Jesus catching away his church. We have this time of global catastrophe coming as the judgment of God. And then we have number three, Jesus Christ will return in conquering glory to this earth. Now, here's the thing about that. There are actually several events associated with the glorious return of Jesus that I think we should be aware of. And the first three events of that have to do with sort of um, before his actual glorious return. Before the actual glorious return, the Bible tells us that Jerusalem will be attacked and half the city will be taken by those who are enemies against God, his Messiah, and the people of Israel. This is what Zechariah chapter 14, verses 1 and 2 says. Listen carefully. Zechariah 14. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, and your spoil will be divided in your midst, for I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. The city shall be taken, the house is rifled, and the women ravished. Half the city shall go into captivity, but the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Jerusalem will be attacked and up to half the city will be taken by forces hostile to the Jewish people and the people of God. Now, I'll just pause right now. You say, well, David, wasn't that fulfilled in one of the many times that Israel or Jerusalem was attacked since the days of Zechariah to the promise? And I would say no, because of the rest of the context of Zechariah, because of the glorious things that Zechariah promises after that, that all of those things spoke towards the future fulfillment, but they did not fulfill it because the Messiah did not return in glory as Zechariah promises that he would. Or Micah. Chapter 4, verse 11 through chapter 5, verse 1 says this. Now also many nations have gathered against you who say, let her be defiled. Let our eye look upon Zion, but they do not know the thoughts of the Lord, nor do they understand his counsel, for he will gather them like sheaves to the threshing floor. Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion, for I will make your horn iron. I will make your hooves bronze. You shall beat in pieces many people. I will consecrate their grain to the Lord and their substance to the Lord of all whole earth. Now gather yourself in troops, O daughter of troops. He has laid siege against us. They will strike the judge of Israel with a rod on the cheek. Friends, again, the Bible describes this attack, this invasion against Jerusalem. But it isn't just in Jerusalem. It's against the Jewish people in Israel as a whole. Let me read you Revelation chapter 12. I'm going to read you verses 13 and 14, then I'm going to read you verse 17. Here we go. Now, when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. I believe that speaks of Israel. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she may fly into the wilderness to her place where she's nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, with Israel. And he went to make war with the rest of her offspring. I believe that describes Christians, believers, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So what do we have here? We have Jerusalem attacked taken captive against armies, against hostile forces of this great world leader. That happens before the glorious return of Jesus Christ in this period that we would call the second half of this great tribulation. Here's a second thing that happens before the glorious return of Jesus. That an army from a global confederation led by a coming world leader gathers at the Valley of Jezreel for a battle or a place called Armageddon in central Israel. Revelation chapter 16, verses 12 through 16 says this. 
Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I'm coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. God gathers them. And then the final line of verse 16 says, and they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew, Armageddon. Matter of fact, When God gathers the nations there. Now, when I say God gathers the nations, I hope nobody has the misunderstanding thinking that these are unwilling nations that God somehow drags to Israel to make war against him. No. When God gathers the nations, all he has to do is remove the restraints And man in his rebellion against, and especially in that period of time, in his uh, subservience to this world leader that's commonly called the Antichrist, mankind will jump at the chance. All God has to do is remove the restraints and the armies will gather at Israel. And you know what God will do when those armies gather? He will taunt the nations. I love this from Joel. This is the prophet Joel, chapter 3, starting at verse 9. Proclaim this among the nations. Prepare for war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords. We don't often hear that one, do we? God says, beat your plowshares into sore, into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Assemble and come all you nations and gather together all around. Cause your mighty ones to go down there, O Lord. This passage of Joel in its context, God is taunting the nations. Come and get me. You think you can fight me? You think you can prevent me from coming in glory to take dominion over the earth? Then come and get it. Come to the valley of Jezreel. You could say that God also mocks the nations that have set themselves against him and his Messiah. I love this passage from Psalm 2, verse 2. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. So God is issuing a great big, you want some of this? to the world and they come they gather together in the valley of Jezreel for the battle that we often refer to as Armageddon okay those are two things that happen before the glorious return the Jewish people are persecuted Jerusalem is at least half occupied they flee for refuge to the wilderness and God allows or directs or removes the restraints for the armies of the world to gather together. And as he does, God taunts them. Then the third thing that happens is Israel turns to their Messiah in faith, confessing their sins. When faithful and repentant Israel petitions Jesus to return, he will come to rescue them. Long ago, God promised this would happen. Let me read to you from Jeremiah chapter three. And again, I, I don't apologize. I just simply explain. I hope you see how I love reading these extended passages of scripture that so dramatically speak of the return of the Messiah. But Jeremiah chapter three, beginning at verse 11. Then the Lord said to me, backsliding Israel has shown herself more righteous than treacherous Judah. 
Go and proclaim these words towards the north and say, return backsliding Israel, says the Lord. For I will not cause my anger to fall on you. For I am merciful, says the Lord. I will not remain angry forever. Only, this is what God says to Israel, acknowledge your iniquity that you have transgressed against the Lord your God and have scattered your charms to alien deities under every great tree and you've not obeyed my voice, says the Lord. Oh, return, backsliding children, says the Lord. For I am married to you and I will take you one from a city and two from a family and bring you to Zion and I'll give you shepherds according to my heart who will feed you with knowledge and understand. Then it shall come to pass that when you're multiplied and increased in the land in those days, says the Lord, that they will say no more. The ark of the covenant of the Lord, it shall not come to mind, nor shall they remember it, nor shall they visit it, nor shall it be made anymore. At that time, Jerusalem shall be called the throne of the Lord and all the nations shall be gathered to it to the name of the Lord to Jerusalem. No more shall they follow the dictates of their evil hearts. In those days, the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel and they shall come together out of the land of the north to the land that I've given as an inheritance to your fathers. I want you to notice there in that passage, he describes the dominion that God will have over all the earth, but in the context of a repentant and restored Israel. Israel's suffering during this time of tribulation will be part of what helps them turn to God. Hosea chapter 5 verse 15 says this, I will return again to my place... Think about that, the ascended Jesus saying, I will return again to my place till they acknowledge their offense. Then they will seek my face. In their affliction, they will earnestly seek me. Isn't that powerful? Jesus saying, I'll return to my place. I'll go back to the heavens until Israel repents. Or as it says in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, I will pour on the house of David, on the inhabitants of Israel, the spirit of grace and supplication. They will look upon me whom they have pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for for a firstborn. Friends, this is the great restoration of Israel that Paul described in Romans chapter 11 and that Jesus listed as an absolute prerequisite for his return. I want you to understand something that in Matthew chapter 23, Jesus looked over Jerusalem after his triumphal entry and he said this, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house has left you desolate, for I say to you, this is what Jesus said to Israel, you will see me no more until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Friends, this national repentance of the Jewish people must happen before Jesus returns in glory. The Old Testament prophets spoke of it. Paul spoke of it. Jesus specifically spoke of it. So what do we have before the glorious return of Jesus? We have number one, well, of course, we have the catching away of the church, but that's another category. We have this great time of tribulation, but then of the events we have the occupation, invasion, and persecution of the Jewish people and occupation of Israel. We have secondly, the drawing of the nations together to battle against the Lord. Third, we have a dramatic national repentance of Israel. Now comes the good part. 
Jesus returns with glory and heavenly armies, cosmic upheaval. Jesus Christ returns in glory from heaven to earth, accompanied by cosmic upheaval and armies in heaven. Here we go. Matthew chapter 24, starting at verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days... The sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the heavens and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the son of man will appear in heaven. What does that mean? I don't know, but it sounds awesome. The sign of the son of man will appear in heaven and all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the son of man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Isn't that amazing? Uh, Revelation describes this as well. Revelation chapter 19, starting at verse 11. Now I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and he who sat on him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God and the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that he should strike the nations and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Friends, if that passage from Revelation doesn't get you excited, you need to breathe on a mirror and see if you're still alive. Okay, now, we understand Jesus Christ is going to return in glory to the earth, but where's he going to go? I mean, look, we're talking about an actual physical return of Jesus Christ to the earth, correct? And that means, according to the law of physics, physically speaking, materially speaking, he can only be in one place at one time. Spiritually, Jesus can be everywhere at the same time. But in his material body, his resurrection body, he's at one place in one time. Where does he go first? Well, I, I'll tell you where I think he goes first. I think he goes first to Basra and defends the Jewish people. You say, David, what are you talking about? Basra? Where's that? Basra was the ancient capital of the Edomites. And it was the site of the modern Jordanian town of Basira. It's about 40 miles from Petra, another stronghold of ancient Edom. This region is attacked by the last world leader because it becomes a refuge for the Jewish people who escape persecution from the world leader and his government. There will be a huge number of Jewish refugees in this general area. Revelation chapter 12, verse 6 tells us that, that they flee to the wilderness for a period of time. And when the region of Basra and Petra are attacked, God will defend his people there. So this is how I see it happening. Again, you, you could order these events differently, but I'm giving it to you how I see it. I see that when Jesus Christ returns first to the earth, first he goes to Basra to fulfill passages such as this. Jeremiah chapter 49, verses 13 and 14. For I've sworn by myself, says the Lord, that Basra shall become a desolation, a reproach, and a waste, and a curse, and all its cities shall be perpetual waste. And I have heard a message from the Lord, and an ambassador has been sent to the nations, gather together, come against her, and rise up to battle. Now go to Jeremiah chapter 49, verse 20. He says, 
Therefore, hear the counsel of the Lord that he's taken against Edom and his purposes that he's purposed against the inhabitants of Timon. Surely the least of his flock shall draw them out. Surely he shall make their dwelling places desolate with them. The earth shakes at the noise of their fall and at the cry of its noise is heard at the Red Sea. Behold, he shall come up and fly like the eagle and spread his wings over Basra. The heart of the mighty men of Edom shall in that day be like the heart of a woman in birth pangs. And then finally, Isaiah chapter 34, verses five and six. God says, for my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Indeed, it shall come down on Edom and on the people of my curse for judgment. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It is made overflowing with fatness, with the blood of lambs and goats, with the fat of the kidneys of rams. For the Lord has a sacrifice in Basra and a great slaughter in the land of Edom. So the way I see it, When Jesus returns, the first place he goes is he goes to Basra, to Edom, modern day Jordan, to stop the massacre or the potential massacre of the Jewish people and defend them. Then where does he go? I believe Jesus then goes to the Valley of Jezreel where the battle of Armageddon takes place. The battle shifts from Edom, that is the Basra slash Petra region, to the valley of Armageddon. Check this out in Isaiah chapter 63, verses 1 through 6. Who is this that comes from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? This one who was glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength, I speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Why is your apparel red and your garments like one who treads the winepress? I have trodden the winepress alone and from the peoples, no one was with me for I have trodden them in my anger and trampled them in my fury. Their blood is sprinkled on my garments and now I've stained all my robes for the day of vengeance is in my heart. And in the year my redeemed has come, I looked, but there was no one to help. And I wondered that there was no one to uphold. Therefore, my own arm brought salvation for me and my own fury, it sustained me. I have trodden down the peoples in my anger, made them drunk in my fury and brought down their strength to the earth. Now, this is why I would place the deliverance in Basra before the battle of Armageddon. Because to me, Isaiah 63 speaks of of someone looking at the Messiah who comes from the battle of Basra to make his conquest there at Armageddon. And friends, I don't have to tell you what happens there at the battle of Armageddon. Jesus goes and fights the battle at the battle of Armageddon. Isaiah chapter 34, verse eight says, for it is the day of the Lord's vengeance, the year of recompense for the cause of Zion. Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse eight says this, then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Joel chapter three, verse 12 says this, let the nations be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat for there I will sit to judge the surrounding nations. Put in the sickle for the harvest is ripe. Come go down for the wine press is full. The vats overflow for their wickedness is great. It's the same image used in Revelation chapter 14 to describe this horrific battle of Armageddon, which really isn't much of a battle. I think it's literally the armies of the earth gathering to the valley of Jezreel in the mistaken notion that they can somehow keep the son of God from coming to the earth and claiming dominion over it. And he destroys them in a terrible slaughter. And then I would say that after Basra, after 
Armageddon at the Valley of Jezreel. Then Jesus goes to the victory of the Mount of Olives. Joel chapter 3, verses 14, 15, and 16. Multitudes, multitudes in the Valley of Decision. By the way, that Valley of Decision, I believe, describes the Valley of Jezreel. That's a reference to the, the Battle of Armageddon. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and moon will grow dark. The stars will diminish their brightness and the Lord will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and earth will shake, but the Lord will be a shelter for his people and the strength of the children of Israel. And then finally, Zechariah chapter 14, verses 3 and 4. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against the nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half the mountain shall move towards the north and half towards the south. Friends, Jesus will return in glory then to Jerusalem and a marvelous restoration will begin to happen on planet earth, beginning in a judgment between the sheep and the goats and the establishment of a thousand year period of Jesus's glorious reign on this earth. But as far as Jesus's return, I really think it happens like this. And again, I, I can't say for sure. Listen, I'm not going to lose my faith if it happens separately than this or differently than this. But Jesus will go first to Basra, then to Armageddon, then come to the Mount of Olives and establish his glorious kingdom there. Friends, Jesus Christ will reign over this earth, over this geography, over whatever people survive the great tribulation and survive the battle of Armageddon. There will be a judgment then between the sheep and the goats and those found worthy will continue on in a millennial earth, perfectly governed by Jesus Christ. And those through whom he rules, the resurrected saints in glory, helping him to rule and reign for a thousand years. That's our destiny. Now, I believe that there are things that you experience in this life that have no explanation in this life. Rather, they can only be explained in light of what God is preparing you for in your role in helping him to govern and rule in that period. God created you as a believer to have a destiny of being his servant to rule and reign with him during that period. We sometimes joke, you know, I'll, I'll be a dog catcher in Destin. I don't know, whatever role of authority God would give us. Uh, somebody else wants to be the mayor of some city on Kauai. There's a lot of people who want that. No, we don't know anything about how such things will be divided, how God will assign things. We just simply know this. We will rule and reign with him. And friends, isn't it entirely possible that God uses this life to prepare and to train you for things that will really be explained and understood then? I know. We ache to make sense of things in the here and now. That's not wrong. But we need, to hold, we need to hold that with a loose hand. Understanding that our existence is not just for whatever years we live on this earth. It's for eternity. It's for participation in God's unfolding plan of the ages, including whatever role he has for you in that thousand year period. Don't be surprised if there's some things 
that don't make much sense in this lifetime, but make perfect sense in your eternal existence and in what God has called you to do after Jesus returns gloriously to this earth. That's just my way of giving you perspective on the fact that when we understand God's great plan of the ages and what God is doing throughout history, it causes us to come back and say, this helps me right here, right now to live and walk faithfully for Jesus Christ. And I don't want to let go of it. I think it's a trap I think it's a trap from the world, the flesh, and the devil to disillusion us with the anticipation not only of Jesus' return, but it's also a delusion to disillusion us with the sense of what God wants to do with us on an eternal level, not just the here and now. Some of us are getting older, well, actually, everybody in this room is getting older, right? We're older than we were yesterday. But you know what I mean by such a phrase. We feel age more and more. With that understanding, we bring to it the fact that this life is only a short portion of our eternal existence. Lord, Work in us the things you can only work in us now to prepare for us for eternity. All right, so do we got this? Jesus, he will return for his church. There will be a time of great catastrophe and calamity that we call the great tribulation. Jesus Christ will return in glory before he returns in glory. Number one, as we said before, Number one, there will be a persecution and occupation of Israel, at least half of Jerusalem. God's people will flee for refuge to Basra, and the nations will gather at Armageddon. And then Jesus Christ will return in amazing glory. As I expect, as I read the scriptures, first to Basra to defend the Jewish people, second to um, the Valley of Jezreel to Armageddon to defeat the arrogant armies that have come against him. And third and finally, come to Jerusalem, to the Mount of Olives, to establish his kingdom and to make his throne. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Father in heaven, we understand that though there's much you've told us about your return, there's still a lot we don't know. So we hold our understanding of these things humbly. We hold it lightly. But Lord, we hold on to that essential truth that you are coming again. You're coming again for your people and you're coming again in glory all across this earth. We say it again with all our heart, Lord. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.